Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for our webinar. We're going to go ahead and give everyone another minute to join. Uh, so we will start at one after. Thank you. Alrighty, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Christy Mahal. I am the Education and Industry Associate at Informs and welcome to our latest offering in our sponsored webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Workforce Optimization, a Use Case for Quantum Inspired Computing Power and is brought to you by Fujitsu Intelligence Technology. Our two panelists are Nicholas Lee and George Baidun. Nicholas has over 16 years of industry experience transforming nascent technologies and ideas into new business models and industry leading products, while George has over six years of industry experience in advanced analytics services, including, or excuse me, leading technology consultation, implementation, and delivery of decision science projects. Uh, they'll deliver what I'm certain will be an informative presentation and we'll reserve the last 15 minutes for Q&A. Feel free to submit questions through the webinar via the Q&A function in Zoom, and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, without further ado, I'll now turn it over to Nicholas. Thanks, Christy. Uh, Fujitsu is a uh, information and communication uh, technology company, so an ICT company. Um, and we're also a digital transformation company. Uh, we employ around 130,000 employees uh, and invest approximately $1.2 billion in R&D each year. Um, this extensive investment has been a key differentiator in advanced compute technologies uh, that we bring to the market, and we've done so for uh, over 84 years. Uh, an example of this R&D investment can be seen through uh, Fujitsu's Fukaku, uh, which is currently the most powerful supercomputer in the world and is making a real impact in society today um, in collaboration with Riken and many areas, including COVID-19. Uh, Fujitsu aims to solve society's most pressing challenges through uh, advancements in innovation, and Fujitsu recently doubled down on our commitment to SDGs um, and has been listed on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for uh, 21 consecutive years. In uh, June 2020, uh, Fugaku became the fastest supercomputer in the world um, in the top 500 list, displacing IBM Summit. Uh, Fugaku uh, also became number one on the green 500 list. Uh, this is a global ranking uh, based on energy efficiency of supercomputers. Uh, while a lot of advanced R&D goes into making the world's fastest supercomputers, uh, benefits of this investment can be seen throughout society and business, such as uh, drug discovery, uh, climate change, um, finding new renewable energy production sources. So there's many benefits, but beyond the benefits of society come benefits of simulating future compute architectures and coming up with more advanced computers, including quantum computers, quantum annealers, uh, and simulators. Uh, one of the fruits of this investment can be seen through Fujitsu's digital annealer. Uh, this is Fujitsu's quantum inspired computing, and that was derived through complementary research on supercomputers. Digital annealer is ultimately a bridge to quantum computers uh, with innovation in both hardware and software that extends the power of optimization beyond classical solvers. Last month, uh, we announced with the University of Toronto uh, the achievement of one megabit scale with the digital annealer. Uh, this puts it ahead in terms of the size of problems Fujitsu can solve compared to those of quantum gate and quantum, compute, quantum annealers. Uh, Fujitsu's focus into quantum uh, is not just quantum inspired. Uh, we also have launched a series of collaboration to make practical quantum computing uh, a reality. Uh, collaboration with Riken, uh, University of Tokyo, uh, NTU Delft, focusing on quantum state control, quantum device integration, uh, and with Osaka University in terms of quantum application, quantum algorithms, and platform software. You know, a world with quantum computers means a future with many solvers, some software, some hardware, um, and others that combine the power of both software and hardware. 
Uh, this diagram comes from TBR, which is the Technology Business Research Inc. And it's a report on the quantum computing landscape. Uh, this isn't a magic quadrant. So being in the uh, top right quadrant doesn't necessarily mean it's the most optimal place to be. On the left, mostly software. And on the right is mostly hardware. Um, in the middle are a combination of uh, hardware and software um, and annealers such as Fujitsu's digital annealer. Uh, the digital annealer is inspired by quantum properties such as superposition, uh, quantum tunneling and entanglement. Um, and this is achieved through innovations again in both software and hardware layers. Um, yet it doesn't require the super cooling or superconducting environments. Um, the digital annealer like quantum annealers can be used to solve certain types of combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, for certain classes of problems, uh, the digital, digital annealer shows a big advantage in terms of speed and performance over other solvers and alternatives. Uh, lastly, I'll refer to the line on this diagram as the quantum computing divide. Um, and this really separates uh, what I would say is production versus lab-based technology. Uh, annealers are ultimately at the forefront and they're breaking into production scale value uh, while we continue to invest in R&D in the future of true quantum gate computers. This diagram is um, kind of representative of what a problem looks like in terms of bit size. Um, Fujitsu is focused on drug discovery, production planning and delivery planning, as well as traffic optimization. Um, our team is always looking to solve the most complex problems with the fastest compute. You know, you don't have to wait for quantum computers to emerge with the ability to scale to production problems uh, to get a handle on this innovation. Today's quantum computers are less than 80 qubits and there's significant issue with qubit fidelity and noise. This ultimately must be solved if we wanna achieve practical applications. That said, Fujitsu's digital annealer uh, has been able to achieve a production scale up to 200,000 bits, um, which that puts it into a, a traffic optimization at a district wide level problem. And with our recent announcement on one megabit scale, uh, this puts large scale complex problems within reach of full scale production deployments. You know, the need for uh, combinatorial optimization is everywhere. Problems include such as scheduling allocation, you know, sequencing planning, you know, ultimately we seek to find the best possible solution from a finite set of possibilities. Um, you know, we see these problems by working closely with trusted partners, with our clients in healthcare, drug discovery, manufacturing, you know, advanced materials, energy, automotive, and retail. And as vice head of consulting and DX programs, I had the privilege and excitement of working uh, with our customers at this forefront. And these are all use cases um, that we are working on today uh, with our customers. You know, with COVID-19, um, you know, our customers are faced with many new challenges. Um, and today we'll explore with George uh, some of the most prevalent examples from a workforce optimization perspective uh, to, to really just demonstrate how digital annealer differentiates in solving uh, this problem, which is a complex set of assets um, and people that we try uh, to optimize in terms of evolving government mandates, occupational safety requirements, and, and overall well, employee well-being. And so in healthcare, uh, resource management primarily centers around one question. How do we most effectively and efficiently serve the greatest number of patients delivering the better or best patient outcomes with the same amount of people and equipment? Hospitals have shown uh, they can reduce the average stay for patients in an emergency department uh, by almost 14%. Uh, and we know that consumer demand hasn't waned much due to COVID-19 uh, with all types of processing plants under immense pressure uh, to increase production and ensure supply chains remain filled. And inefficiencies in manufacturing can account for up to 40% of every dollar spent. So it's vital that we look and optimize and remediate any sort of inefficiencies um, in the manufacturing space. And while many energy producers consider cutting staff and shutting down assets um, as a cost savings alternative, that's not always the best route. One energy company that uh, used Fujitsu's digital annealer solution was able to increase their workforce efficiency. And to put that into context, uh, just a 1% productivity gain uh, for this customer, which was around 14,000 employees equated to $27 million in additional projects that this company could support uh, through a greater productivity of its existing workforce. Workforce optimization uh, plays a key role in society. And uh, now I'll hand it over to George who will talk about the physics uh, behind how we solve uh, workforce optimization problems. George. Thank you, Nicholas. 
Um, so the reason why we can use physics to solve combinatorial optimization problems is because we can frame a mathematical problem as an energy minimization problem in physics. And there's a fundamental concept in physics called the principle of minimum energy, which states that everything always tries to find the least energy state. So um, if you create a mapping between your optimization problem and a problem in physics, we can then use physics to find the minimum energy state and translate it back to the mathematical problem which we would have solved. And this, this is also true in quantum physics where quantum annealing is using physics to find the minimum energy state. Quantum annealing is well suited to solve certain types of combinatorial optimization problems and it promises an exponential increase in computational capabilities. However, it is still at an emergent phase and years away from practical applications. So to go into more details, for a quantum system, the Hamiltonian is a function that maps the state of a system to its energy. And a quantum annealer can support Hamiltonians that take the form of the quadratic binary function, like the one we are showing on the left side of the screen. The coefficients of the linear terms are called biases, and the coefficients of the quadratic terms are called couplings. A positive bias essentially tries to pull a bit to be equal to zero, and a negative bias pulls the bit to be equal to one. Um, similarly, a positive coupling between two bits uh, penalizes the two bits from both being equal at to one at the same time. So programming a quantum annealer consists in providing the biases and couplings in order to represent an optimization problem. And given these values, a quantum annealer defines the corresponding energy landscape using couplers and magnetic fields and finds the lowest energy state through an annealing process. So um, at the beginning of the annealing process, all bits are put in a superposition state by applying a certain magnetic field. And then during the annealing process, the energy profile of the quantum system is changed by modifying the magnetic field and the couplings between bits so that at the end of the annealing process, the energy landscape corresponds to the problem Hamiltonian that was provided. Under the right conditions, the final state of our system should correspond to the lowest energy state of the problem Hamiltonian. And therefore, we have an answer to the problem we're trying to solve. So um, we give here on the right a simple example with only two bits and a Hamiltonian that has two biases and a coupling. The corresponding energy landscape at the end of the annealing process will have four different states and four different relative energies. In this case, x1 is equal to zero and x2 equal to one is the lowest energy state. And therefore the quantum annealer will have a higher probability of being in this state at the end of the annealing process. Now, this is a very simple example with only two bits and therefore we have four states. But more generally for a problem with n bits, the number of state exponentially grows and is equal to two to the power of n of possible states. This makes this technology suitable for solving combinatorial optimization problems. So we have seen so far the main idea behind quantum annealers and why they can be used to solve combinatorial optimization problems. However, these machines have many challenges today, such as qubit stability and the need for an expensive cooling infrastructure to maintain a quantum state. They also provide certain limitations in terms of scalability and connectivity between the bits. Now progress is being made, but most likely we are years away from truly practical quantum computing applications. Therefore at Fujitsu, we have developed the digital annealer, which is an architecture that is ready to solve combinatorial optimization problems today, which are typically difficult and time consuming for conventional computers to process. And because the digital annealer is built with digital circuit, it can operate at room temperature and does not face the same limitations as the quantum computers, but it still provides many folds of acceleration in solving certain classes of combinatorial optimization problems. 
it also has full connectivity between bits and can tackle actual problems today. So um, as we have seen, uh, recent advances in physics and engineering have created new technologies that are capable of solving certain types of combinatorial optimization problems. And these problems are called in the operations research community, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization or more commonly named QBOS. And they are at the heart of the experimentations that are currently being carried out with quantum annealers and Fujitsu dig digital annealer. Recent progress in operations research has established that QBO formulations can cover a wide range of combinatorial optimization problems. And for this reason, QBO modeling has emerged as a promising alternative to the traditional modeling methodologies. Now, formally, a QBO is defined as minimizing Y as a quadratic function of binary variables. We often also uh, see an alternative formulation using vectors and a symmetric square matrix um, or with an upper triangular matrix. Um, QBO models are known to be NP-hard, um, and many problems can be easily and very naturally be formulated as a QBO model. And these are the problems where we have yes, no decisions and where no constraints other than the ones requiring the variables to be binary um, exist. So uh, one example of such a problem is the max cut problem, where we partition a non-directed graph into two sets so that the number of edges between the two sets is as large as possible. The decision for this problem is very binary since we can very naturally define a binary variable for every vertex that indicates that the vertex is in one set. However, a lot of problems do not fit into the category of those that can naturally be formulated as a cubo. And this happens if, for example, we have constraints such as equality or inequality constraints, or because certain variables are continuous or discrete and not binary, or because we are dealing with higher order polynomials. So recent advances in operations research have determined reformulation techniques to transform many problems into cubos. As a result, we now can cover a wide variety of models found in industries using cubo modeling. So um, in the next slides, I will be showing three useful and very commonly used reformulation techniques. The first type of transformation is about handling equality constraint um, in a cubo. And this might sound surprising since the U in cubo stands for unconstrained. So um, to demonstrate this, let's consider a cubo and let's add to it one linear equality, some AI XI is equal to B. The equality constraint is equivalent to saying that sum of AI XI minus B squared is equal to zero. And since the left term is always bigger or equal to zero, we can now define a new cubo as the sum of our original cubo and a penalty cubo that represents this equality constraint. P in this equation is called the penalty scalar. And if P is chosen wisely, which means big enough, we are sure that the optimal solution will always have the penalty cubo equal to zero. And this means that our constraint is satisfied. Therefore, minimizing our new cubo is equivalent to minimizing our original cubo with the equality constraint. Practically, we can define P by studying the possible ranges of the different components of our cubo so that it is never advantageous to violate any of our constraints. Another approach would be to start with a certain value of P and iteratively solve the cubo, check for violations, and then adjust the penalty scalar until no violations are found. So we have just seen how to handle linear equality constraints. And now the question is, how can we handle linear inequality constraints? So to demonstrate this, let's consider a cubo and let's add to it a linear inequality constraint. Sum of AI XI is less than B. We can assume that AI and B are integers without loss of 
generality. Um, in fact, if they're not integers, it is always possible to multiply this inequality by a constant in order to have integers. And the idea here is that we want to transform this linear inequality into a linear equality, which we have seen can be modeled as a cubic. So the first step consists in introducing a new slack variable, S, which is equal to B minus the sum of AI XI. Since we know that XIs are all binary and all coefficients are integers, we know that the slack variable is discrete and positive. So the second step is to expand the discrete slack variable S by writing it as a linear sum of binary variables. And by doing so, we now have a cubo with a linear equality constraint and only binary variables. We have seen in the previous slide that we can transform such a problem into a cubo, and therefore we are now able to handle linear inequalities with cubos. So in the previous slide, we've seen how we transformed our Slack discrete variable into a linear sum of binary variables. And many different types of expansions can be used to do so. So um, let's consider a discrete variable D with a lower bound of zero and upper bound of M. We can define M binary variables and replace D by the sum of the binary variables. And this is called a unary expansion. For example, if M is equal to 50, we can define 50 binary variables with D equal to their sum. The disadvantage of this technique is that depending on the value of M, we can end up with a very large number of newly introduced variables. So another popular type of expansion is the binary expansion, where we use coefficients that are powers of two and this results in greatly reducing the number of newly introduced variables. For example, if M is equal to 50, we can write D as a linear sum of only five variables. Um, however, the disadvantage of this technique is that we can have big differences in the coefficients, which might take the problem harder to solve. And these were just two examples of expansions, but there are many other possibilities that exist. Um, in addition to handling discrete variables, a similar technique can be used to discretize continuous variables with a certain step size. So as a summary, we have seen that cubos can cover a variety of problems that can be naturally formulated as cubos. And these problems um, are the ones with yes, no decisions and no constraints. In addition to this, we have seen that many problems can be reformulated as cubos using certain transformation techniques. And in the previous slide, we have seen how we can handle equality and inequality constraints, as well as discrete and continuous variables. Now, many other types of constraints and other problems, such as higher order binary optimization, or hobos, can also be covered with cubos. Uh, but we will not cover this topic in this presentation. Um, we put below uh, a reference to an excellent article on this subject for those who are interested. Um, in addition to this, cubo modeling has gained significant traction in recent years. Um, in fact, we're seeing a 500% increase in the number of related publications in operations research over the past five years. As a result, we expect more advances to come on both the theory and the applications of cubo modeling. Now, resource allocation optimization is one example of a problem that is well suited to be modeled as a cubo. And this use case came to us through a discussion with experts from the oil and gas industry, which is an industry that often undertakes large and complex construction projects. For example, building a refinery can cost tens of billions of dollars and can span across several years. These large projects are typically commissioned to EPC companies that coordinate all the design, procurement, and construction activities to ensure that a project is completed as required and on time. EPC companies need to seamlessly manage staffing of tens of thousands of resources 
such as engineers, across multiple concurrent projects all over the world. And revenue is typically generated when resources hours are built on client projects. So typically, each construction project issues a list of requests for resources with, cer with certain requirements such as skills and experience and the location. Additionally, um, individuals would have several attributes and preferences. Incorporating all the different factors and associated costs to produce a highly efficient allocation of resources across all requests is a very complex task. And the typical current approach is very manual and decentralized across different regions with planners allocating resources to requests using spreadsheets uh, within their own region. And the use of human judgment with little coordination and lack of global view of workforce leaves room for improvement, both in terms of having a better resource allocation as well as the company bottom line. So we will show that by using the quantum inspired digital annealer and the optimization capabilities, EPC companies can improve profit and reduce cost while also making faster and data driven staffing decisions. Additional benefits include eliminating human error, easily adapting to changing conditions, rapidly implementing new policies related to resource staffing, and these would be, for example, policies related to traveling, for example, during COVID-19, um, as well as improving employee satisfaction. So to go into more details on how we model this problem, the inputs that we used include information on resources, requests, locations, travel durations, and costs, as well as additional staffing constraints. So for engineers, available information includes their skills and competency levels, as well as their home location, the trainings they followed, their legal documents, and any other constraint that prevents them from traveling. Information on the requests include the skills and experience required, the start and end dates, whether the request can be performed remotely or if it requires on-site presence, the expected usage for part-time requests, the trainings that are required, and the hours of onboarding required for new resources. We also have information on the time and cost it takes to travel from one location to another, and the cost of staying at a certain location. And finally, in a real world situation, assignments for the very near term future have already been made. And changing these assignments could create a disruption for the operations and would be very costly for the business. Therefore, we have inputs around these near term assignments and whether they can be modified, as well as a cost associated with modifying them. And this cost essentially reflects the effort and time required for a project manager to interview and onboard a new resource to a project. Now, the objective of our model is to build a weekly schedule for a horizon of six months that maximizes the overall profit. And profit is equal to the difference between the revenue and five different costs, labor, traveling, training, onboarding, and changes to the initial staffing. The constraints include the start and end dates of the requests, ensuring that the request usage is respected and that only one resource is assigned to request at the same time. We also have constraints that ensure that a resource is never used more than 100% of their time, that we have a limit on how many requests are assigned at the same time to a resource, that we respect the resource specific constraints such as planned vacations, and that we never make assignments that require a resource to be at two different locations at the same time. Finally, additional constraints ensure that the assignments are compatible in both in terms of skills and amount of experience required, and that the resource has the legal documents to work at the assigned location, and that their travel preferences are respected. So to model this problem, taking into account all the constraints, we write our cubo as a sum of the objective cubo that represents the profit and hundreds of penalty cubos with an associated penalty coefficient. 
Some of the constraints are explicitly modeled as a penalty cubo, while others are implicitly informed with the way we define our variables and our sets. So in the coming two slides, I will show how we modeled two of these constraints. The first constraint that we will show is about ensuring that a resource is in one location per period. In our model, we defined a binary variable x a r p that equals one if the resource r is assigned to request a on a period p. So ensuring that a resource is not assigned to two locations at the same time is equivalent to saying that for any two requests, a1 and a2, that require on-site presence at two different locations, x a1 rp multiplied by x a2 rp is equal to zero for every period and for every resource. And these equalities ensure that both binary variables can never be equal to one at the same time. Since the product of two binary variables is always positive, we can define a penalty cubo as the sum of these products that has also has a minimum value of zero. And if we choose P, which is the penalty scalar big enough, we will ensure that in our optimal solution, the penalty cubo is equal to zero, which means that every individual product of the binary variable is also equal to zero. And this means that we have um, satisfied our constraint. Now, moving to our second example of constraints, which states that for every request, we can have at most one resource assigned on a certain period. In the linear fashion, this constraint can be modeled as, um, as an inequality constraint, where for every request and period, the sum over all resources of XARP is at most one. We have already seen that we can handle inequality constraints in a cubo format. And in this case, we define a slack variable SAP for every request and period that equals one if the request is not assigned to any resource on period P. And with this slack variable, we can transform our inequality to a linear equality constraint which we have seen can be transformed to a cubo by squaring, the by squaring the difference and adding it as a penalty cubo. So hopefully this gives an idea on how we can model our problem using cubos. Um, I will not be covering all the remaining components of our cubo and instead will show you a demo version of this model. So, after we log in to the user interface, we see a page with a navigation menu on the left uh, that contains three main sections. Uh, first, we have the data management section where the user can view and edit all the data that supports making the staffing decisions. Um, and the, th this data includes information on the project, the request, the resources, and many other data sets. Second, we have um, the optimization section where we can launch an optimization job once all the data is, probably, is properly input. And third, we have the dashboard section where we have four tabs that allow us to see the results and their associated metrics. So starting with the data management part where the resource specialist can review and ensure that the data, is, that data input is complete and accurate. So for example, if we click on the projects page, we can see that we have 10 different projects. Um, and if we select the requests that are related to one project, for example, gaseous storage facility, we see that we have 163 requests for resources related to this project. So let's review one of these requests. As discussed, uh, we see that we have our start and end dates, the bill rate, the location of the request, and a checkbox that indicates if on-site presence is required. On the right side of this form, uh, we see the usage percentage for this request, which indicates that this is a full-time assignment, the skills and experience level required, as well as the trainings and some additional data points. Similarly, we can have the list of all resources available. And in this case, we have 500 engineers. 
So if we select one of these resources, for example, William Gonzalez, um, we can see that this individual is based out of Casper, prefers not to travel outside of their home location. And we also have the list of the legal statuses that they have, um, the skills and years of experience, as well as the trainings that they have already followed. And um, if we scroll down a bit, we can see if William has any predefined assignments. And in this case, we see that William has already been assigned for a certain period of time to a full-time request. So after the staffing specialist ensures that all the data is accurate and complete, we are ready to run an optimization job. To do so, we simply click on optimization jobs and we create a new optimization job. What is happening here is that all the data is being packaged and sent to a server for two algorithms to run. The first one is the baseline algorithm, which is a heuristic that simulates how a human staffing specialist would make the staffing decisions. This algorithm prioritizes the most urgent requests according to their earliest start date, and then assigns for each request the resource that satisfies all the requirements of the request while also reducing the cost. And this is essentially what a human would do if they were making the staffing decision um, in a manual way. The second algorithm that we run is the optimization problem that is solved by the digital annealer. We first generate the appropriate cubos and send the request to the digital annealer to solve it. Once both algorithms finish, they get evaluated and their metrics are compared. And the results are then returned back to the front end to review in the dashboard. So um, after a few minutes of running, the job status changes to done, which means that the optimization is complete. So to import the results, uh, we have clicked here on import job results, and we are currently waiting for the results to finish loading in order to visualize them in the dashboard section. Um, on the first tab that will first appear, um, there will be the problem overview page, which shows us key metrics of the data set that was used. And then the other um, tabs available in the dashboard will allow us to compare the solutions from the baseline and the digital annealer. So on the problem overview page, we can see that the data set that we are currently using has a total of 10 projects. And each project has hundreds of requests for resources with a total of approximately 1,600 requests. The total number of resources is 500 and the horizon for staffing is 24 weeks. We have um, a total of 10 locations of resources and requests, which means that we are taking into account the travel costs between 90 pairs of cities. And making the decision on who should be assigned to what request every week is a combinatorial optimization problem which means that the number of possibility exponentially grows with the data size and can very quickly become an intractable problem that is challenging to compute for even the most powerful computers. So with our current data set, we estimate that there are about more than 10 to the power of 6,300 different possibilities of staffing schedules. And this big number justifies the need for an optimization technology to efficiently solve it. So moving to the profit overview tab, um, the different bar charts here show us how the profit, revenue, and expenditures compare between the DA and the baseline algorithm. We can see, for example, that the profit is about 15% or $2 million higher with the DA solution when compared to the baseline solution. The profit is the difference between billing revenue on the second box and the expenditures in the third box. And when we compare the revenues, we see that the DA solution results in an increased revenue, which means that overall, the utilization of resources increases. At the same time, we also see that the DA has lower expenditures compared to our baseline. So um, looking at the details of the expenditures, we can see that the labor costs are identical, and this is normal because this cost is constant for a given workforce. 
the travel cost is smaller for the DA and is actually equal to zero, which means that the DA found a solution where no resource needs to travel. In addition to reducing the cost, this contributes to a better employee satisfaction. The training cost is smaller with the DA, which means that employees are better assigned to requests based on their previous trainings. The onboarding cost is slightly higher with the DA, and this could be a side effect of having a higher revenue because when more people are billing, more people get onboarded to projects. And finally, the schedule change cost is smaller with the DA, which means that we are reducing changes to the initial schedule in the very short term. Now, um, moving to the results explorer tab, this view allows us to show in more details how the revenue and expenditures compare between the DA solution and the baseline algorithm through a dynamic pivot table. The table that we are showing here provides the key metrics of the solutions for each country. We can see, for example, that Canada has a higher bidding revenue with the baseline algorithm when compared to the optimized solution. And this result might sound counterintuitive since the optimized solution should in theory provide better results. However, um, this is a, a, one illustration of the difference between optimizing at a local level and optimizing globally. So um, in essence, if every country was trying to optimize their staffing schedule locally, this might lead to a less optimal solution at the global level. And therefore, there is value in moving from local staffing decisions to a global optimization. And then uh, finally, the tab staffing schedule shows us the solution in more details for each resource in a Gantt chart. We can see that the baseline and optimized solutions are not different for all resources. Um, the DA uh, optimization algorithm has strategically identified the schedules that need to be modified in order to achieve the overall increase in profit. So now let's only select resources that had a difference between the two solutions. The percentage shown next to each name is the difference in utilization between the two solutions. We can see, for example, that Jade Gonzalez has a 17% improvement in utilization and on the other hand, John Johnson is much less utilized. However, overall, we can see in the top right corner that we are able to improve by 1% the utilization of our workforce with the DA. It would be very challenging for a human to find sometimes counterintuitive trade-offs to make in order to achieve that global improvement in our profit. So to summarize, um, the goal of this demo was to show a comparison in generating staffing schedules between the digital annealer and a manual approach. And we have seen that the digital annealer solution achieves a 15% increase in profit on our data set, faster and data-driven staffing decisions, and improved employee satisfaction. So now I will pass it back to Nicolas for the concluding remarks. Great, thank you, George. Um, so I'd like to leave an impression, um, you know, that we couldn't be at a more exciting space for annealers. Um, you know, while qubits still have a long ways to go before you have fidelity, uh, alternatives can be found in the digital annealer. Um, we're now seeing industry verticals in a position to move across uh, the quantum computing divide. And we can see production scale evolving through this landscape uh, with a new generation of unique solvers. Um, lastly, it's, it's never too late uh, or too early to get engaged. We have customers that are just starting uh, this path that just wanna learn, uh, while we have others that have already formed their Kubos and want to partner with Fujitsu to apply their algorithms through Fujitsu's digital annealer. Given a Kubo can be run on digital annealer or future quantum gate computers, um, organizations today are scaling up and they're building algorithms to differentiate uh, their future business. Thanks for listening. I guess we'll open it up for Q&A now. So George, under the Q&A, there's a couple of questions in there that are more technical. Do you want to maybe jump in on those? Oh, I apologize. Um, thank you both for your 
help. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. We have a few questions coming in already. Um, we have a three part question from Nishikanta. The first part is, let's see, uh, will you please show the graph that generated before the optimization algorithm was run? Um, um, I believe they missed that portion. Sure. Um, so I, I, I guess the question is about um, this table. Is this what is meant by graph? Uh, Nishikanta, if you want to go ahead and uh, type in if that's the correct graph that you're looking for, um, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I see also uh, the, the question from, mm -hmm. from the same person about what language is used to code both uh, the graph and optimization. Um, so, so I guess um, so th there are two um, parts for this, um, for this question. First, we have the application layer, which includes our front end and back end. In this case, um, in this case, we used um, an open source, um, an open source language in order to have our um, front end and back end of the application. Um, uh, I believe we used Scala. In in terms of our algorithms, so the code that is used to generate our cubos. In this case, we used Python. Um, however, it, it is free for the operations research specialist to use um, other uh, programming languages if, if they prefer so. But Python is usually very well suited for um, uh, mathematical optimization because uh, there are toolboxes and there are libraries that exist that could make uh, cubo generation an easier task. So hopefully this answers the question. Alrighty, and then we have one from Julie that says, thank you for the insightful presentation. When delivering a project with the digital annealer, what would be the most suitable or sought set of skills? Um, sure. Um, so th this all depends on um, the phase of the project um, and wh what is it that we're trying to build. So um, typically, when we deliver these types of projects, we go through a phased approach, which starts with a proof of concept where we are proving the technology, that the technology works. Um, and then we, once we've proven that, um, then we build our application layer that could use these um, algorithms. So I will first talk about that first phase, which is the proof of concept phase. Um, in this case, Typical skills would include operations research scientists, um, such as myself, um, and might include data engineers as well as business analysts. But I would say the most important skills would be operations research. And their role would be to model the business problem um, into a Cubo format and code the algorithm and tune it um, in order to achieve good results. Um, and then for the second phase, which is um, if we are trying to build a production solution, um, then in addition to the operations research scientist, we need to add um, all the skills that are required, um, such as um, user experience designer, so UX UI designer, uh, of course, business analyst. Uh, we need front end, back end developers. Um, if there's integration that is required, we would need an integration architect. Um, also, there's a need for solution architect. Um, so the, the typical skills that would be required to build a, an application um, essentially would be required at this phase. So ho hopefully this answers um, your question, Judy. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have another question from Mark. Has the Fujitsu digital annealer been used for vehicle routing problems or TSP type problems? Uh, yes, it has. Um, and the TSP is an example of a problem that is uh, well suited to be modeled as a cubo. Um, and maybe I can give an example of a variation of the TSP um, that was used uh, within Fujitsu. And this, this is a publicly available information um, that is similar to TSP. So uh, within our own uh, warehouse, uh, typically um, our um, the, the staff at, at Fujitsu um, needs to pick up uh, the um, 
pick up items essentially from the warehouse. And the user, the usual approach was to um, pick up the items as in the same order as um, the orders that were received. So Fujitsu has implemented within its own warehouse a solution that optimizes the routes that these individuals need to make within the warehouse in order to reduce the travel distance. Um, and um, th this information is publicly available. I believe the, the, the number was about 40% decrease in the travel distance, if I'm not mistaken, but um, the, the reference can be seen uh, publicly. So hopefully this, this answers your question. All righty, and then we have one from Shazi. Uh, thank you. They say, thank you for the informative presentation. Could you elaborate what is the quantum inspired feature in the digital annealer that enables it to solve large scale optimization problems that classical computers can't? Sure. Um, so the, the digital annealer is essentially an application uh, specific CMOS um, hardware um, that is built to solve certain types of uh, combinatorial optimization problem. And um, the, the algorithm that runs within the digital annealer is inspired by uh, quantum phenomena such as superposition um, and um, so on in order, um, in order to find this minimum energy state. So the, the algorithm that runs on the digital annealer is inspired by the quantum annealing uh, process. So that, that's the first um, part of my answer to this question. The second part is about the applications uh, for the digital annealer. So as we've seen, the digital annealer can solve the same problems, um, which are the cubos essentially, as the quantum annealer. And this is also a reason why um, the, the digital annealer is a quantum inspired technology. All righty, thank you. And then we have one from Susan. Uh, what is the baseline algorithm that the DA is being compared to? Sure. Um, so the baseline algorithm is um, essentially a heuristic that we, we have coded um, in order to simulate uh, that a human staffing specialist uh, is, is, is doing the staffing um, in a manual way using spreadsheets, for example. So the way that this algorithm runs is that we first prioritize our requests according to the most urgent one. So if, if I was a, a staffing specialist, I would naturally start by staffing the requests that are the, the nearest in terms of time. Uh, so I, I would, for example, staff um, one that is coming in, in the coming week and later focus on the ones that are coming in the next month or year. So that's the, that's the priority that is used in this baseline algorithm. And then for each one of these requests, we pick the resource that minimizes the cost on this uh, request. So for example, um, for, for the people who are available at that time, we pick the one that does not require to travel uh, or that the travel cost would be minimal um, and if their vacation permits, so if they're available and so on. So if we do it in this priority and staff people um, in this sequence, we get a certain um, assignment of resources that is comparable to what a human staffing specialist would have done if they were making this in a manual way. So hopefully this clarifies it. All righty, and then we do have a question. Uh, what other types of use cases where the uh, digital annealer can be applied? This was directed toward Nicholas. Yeah, um, there's many use cases um, that, um, that we use it for today. So uh, drug discovery is one that um, we've got quite a bit of um, um, press on you know, recently uh, where we've um, formed a, a joint uh, venture with uh, Pepti Dream. Um, so drug discovery is a big one. Um, I would say in the energy space, um, there's quite a bit in terms of not, not just the workforce optimization, but like well placement optimization. Um, in um, manufacturing, there's job shop scheduling. Um, and um, I would say in probably in, in smart cities, it comes down to uh, the vehicle routing optimization. Uh, those are 
you know, projects that uh, we work on quite heavily. Um, George, any other ones you want to maybe add that I'm not referencing off the top of my head? Um, uh, sure. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned drug discovery, but yeah. this is this is a main um, one, especially with, with the current pandemic. Um, but may, maybe to complement your answer, um, Nicholas, every problem that could be modeled as a cubo, um, which means we have either yes, no decisions, or we have discrete variables. Um, essentially, if, if we can model the problems, either naturally or through transformation techniques into a cubo, then we can solve this business problem using the digital angular. And um, even if the full problem cannot be entirely modeled in a cubo, um, the operations research scientists sometimes can find um, solutions to overcome this by um, e either combining it with a heuristic or with other um, solvers or techniques. And, and George, I would just add that I think, um, you know, another area that, that uh, is quite prevalent, especially with, with COVID, uh, supply chain logistics. So we're seeing a lot of customers that uh, really have uh, difficult problems and they're looking to solve in that space. But um, in the slide I shared earlier, there's there's um, a number of different areas that uh, obviously that we're focusing on. Um, essentially, we're working at the forefront of many of these different types of problems. But uh, I think, George, you gave kind of the perfect uh, answer to that is uh, any combinatorial kind of optimization problem that has a specific criteria that we set out is, is a good target for uh, the digital annealer. And we do have a couple questions asking about availability for public asset access or for research purposes. Or is this available? Yeah, so we have a kind of our standard uh, engagement model. And at the end of this, actually on this slide here, um, we have our contact information, uh, fiddle.digital at fujitsu.com. Um, and so I, I would recommend just getting in touch with us there. Uh, we do have a number of you know, academia programs that we're working with. Uh, we have a co-creation facility at the University of Toronto. Um, so uh, we do quite a bit in the academia space. Um, and, um, and like I say, please feel free to contact us and uh, we can definitely talk about your needs in that space. All righty. And then let's see. Uh, how do you know that a problem is good to be tackled with the digital annealer? I'm not sure if you've already answered that question, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, very, yeah, I, I'll su summarize essentially the previous answer. It's so the ideal case is we have yes, no decisions that need to be made uh, and no constraints. That's a very ideal case and probably it's not going to happen very often. So the second um, also good um, case is um, it's a problem that has certain constraints that could be transformed into a cubo format, or it has discrete variables that could be um, written as a sum of binary variables through our binary expansion, or if we have continuous variables that we are able to, um, to discretize and it's acceptable from, from a business perspective. Um, so so that's, uh, that's kind of, um, I, I think the intuition behind assessing whether a problem could be solved with a digital annealer. Um, of course, there are other factors um, such as the precision requirements as well as the number of bits that could play a role, whether we can use our technology to solve the problem. Um, so assessment is based essentially on intuition as well as looking at the data and how large the problem is to ensure that it can fit on the digital annealer. So hopefully this clarifies it. And George, I would just add that beyond the technical kind of feasibility aspect, we also do typically do a business feasibility. Um, so we wanna make sure that the business value is there. So there's a whole process that we have in terms of identifying kind of the sweet spot in terms of collaboration, both from a business feasibility and technical feasibility point of view. Alrighty, and then I believe this will be our last question. Uh, how do I learn about operations research positions in Fujitsu? Yeah, so I, I can take that one as well, George. Um, I, I mean, definitely uh, we have our public website in terms of a lot of our job postings, uh, but I would also say if you get directly in contact with, with us at this email address, um, it is an area that we're growing uh, within the company. 
Um, and so feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're also both active on, on LinkedIn, so you can reach out to us there. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's any further questions that you have, uh, or if you want to submit your CVs, uh, please do that at the uh, email address below. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today on behalf of Nicholas, George, Fujitsu, and Informs. Uh, I thank you for joining us. A recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel very soon. I also encourage you to join us for our next webinar on December 16th. Thank you all for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.